Jalen Brunson solidified himself as a star in this league last season, but he has yet again taken his game to a completely new level. Brunson and the Knicks are looking like they could be a real problem in the Eastern Conference. But while things look amazing right now, I want to also look at how Jalen got here. As someone who saw him at an open practice before his freshman season at Villanova, this ascension has truly been special to witness. Despite one of the greatest college careers ever, Brunson had very little hype entering the 2018 NBA Draft. Today I'm going to be reviewing how Jalen Brunson went from college legend to NBA afterthought to NBA superstar. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell, I would really, really appreciate it. It does help me out a ton. Smaller NBA YouTuber trying to grow, and without further ado, let's get right into the video. Let's start well at the start. While I'd hope most of us are aware, for those of us who aren't, Jalen Brunson had a legendary college career at Villanova. He earned two national championships, a national player of the year, sporting news player of the decade, his number in the rafters, and a plethora of other honors. You'd think with a resume like this, you would at least be a surefire first round pick, right? Nope. And the funny part is the reasons were actually pretty justified. While anyone who watched Jalen at Nova can see how his surgical game is effective in the NBA, I can't really blame anyone who didn't think it would translate. While we know his intangibles and creation are cream of the crop, it's actually pretty easy to see how Brunson wasn't that enticing as a prospect. This is a 6'1 to 6'2 guard who didn't really have a typical wowing ability to point to. He wasn't jumping out of the gym and he wasn't some kind of Steph-esque perimeter shooting prospect. This isn't to say he was an extremely skilled and an outstanding shooter, just that there wasn't a single thing for him compared to most top prospects. Oh, and also part of that college resume is that he had to stay in college for three years to get that resume. While again, anyone who was watching knows how Brunson dissected defenses, it's not too hard to see why he wasn't a highly touted prospect. He fits one of the two most common archetypes that to me represent outstanding college players whose style of play often doesn't translate to the NBA. These two archetypes would be the small scorer like a Brunson or a Marcus Howard and a more traditional big like a Luka Garza or Oscar Shibwe. Brunson and Howard were very different players obviously, but I'm just speaking in general terms. While yes, this was far from luck of the draw and a team definitely should have recognized Brunson's talent before the 33rd pick, it's not exactly hard to see why an older 6'1 guard without any type of jump off the page prospect talent fell. Brunson's rise despite this is the best part of this whole thing, but I just wanted to make sure we're not doing too much revisionist history here. He was never a highly touted NBA prospect for logical reasons, but this just emphasizes how much of an anomaly Brunson is. You look at Brunson's draft position and where he is now and see a story of triumph, but so much has happened in between. Jalen has shown improvement year over year despite the path of logic that says older college players won't improve as much as an 18 to 20 year old prospect. Even from his all-star level season last year to this year, he has improved significantly. Brunson's first two NBA seasons are nearly identical, which is kind of funny. 9.3 points versus 8.2 points, 3.2 assists versus 3.3 assists, 2.3 rebounds versus 2.4 rebounds, 46.7% from the field versus 46.6% from the field, and 34.8% from deep versus 35.8% from deep. Although these stats are, as you can tell, more or less the same, we can still see improvement from Brunson from his first to second year. While these stats are nearly identical, the about 22 minutes a game in his rookie year versus the about 18 minutes a game in his second year is where we differentiate. While 22 versus 18 doesn't sound like a big difference by itself, when you think of those four or so minutes in the scale of 22 or 18, you start to see things. Second year, Brunson managed to improve in efficiency, rebounding, and assisting while having a part of his minutes slashed and starting only 16 games compared to 38 in his rookie year. While yes, his points per game dropped by one, I would still say he was better than he was as a rookie. Although he was better than he was as a rookie, rookies and second year players, much less rookies and second year players who spent three years in school that average in and around 9, 2, and 3 aren't exactly the talk of the town. Jalen Brunson's third season began a streak of steady improvement that has continued to and through the moment I am writing this. While no one had all-star face of a franchise expectations, the 2020-21 season showed us that Brunson would at least have a decent NBA career. In 2021, we saw Brunson get 25 plus minutes a night for the first time, and he's never looked back since. Brunson's improvement more or less across the board in his third season compared to his first two was immense, and Villanova fans everywhere were starting to get a glimpse of the Brunson they knew in the NBA. In his first two seasons, Jalen Brunson averaged 9, 2, and 3 on 47, 35, 76 for a true shooting of 55.3 in 20.1 minutes a night. In his third season, Jalen Brunson averaged 13, 3, and 4 on 52% from the field, 
41% from deep and 80% from the line for a true shooting of 61.8% in exactly 25 minutes a night. The 2020-21 season is where we saw Brunson truly get comfortable in the NBA. He improved drastically across the board and started to show those intangibles that would launch him into stardom. His efficiency jump while increasing his volume is what's most interesting to me. Part of his jump is obviously due to the increased opportunity he was getting, but he had clearly also improved drastically since his rookie year. This is where our pattern of continued growth starts that is still continuing into Brunson's mid to late 20s. While all of Brunson's season to season jumps have been due to a combination of work and increased opportunity, I feel like the work gets discounted for some people. While we're only at the start of this journey, you don't just go from 47, 35, 76 to 52, 41, 80 because you got more shots. In fact, logic says that you should be less efficient the more shots you take. The interesting thing to me is how little Brunson was used in the playoffs this season. I understand how defense will become a lot more complicated with Luka and Brunson on the court, but a dynamic player even at this time like Brunson having his minutes slash from 25 minutes in the regular season to 16 in the postseason confuses me. Again, I understand the matchup hunting point, especially if both Luka and Brunson were on the court, but part of me thinks he could have been a difference maker in this seven game series against the Clippers. Through three games in this series, the Mavs were up 2-1 with Brunson playing 20 minutes a night, averaging 13-2-2 on 59-57-89. In the last four games of this series, in which the Mavs went 1-3, Brunson was playing around 13 and a half minutes a night and averaged 5-3-1 on 32-33-50. Now, did Brunson play pretty awful here? Yeah. Was this in part due to getting about 10 minutes in two of these games and above 15 in only one other? Also, yeah. It's hard to exactly get into a rhythm when you're getting up three shots. We can see the reason why he didn't get as many minutes as he probably should have, but I still think this was some pretty bad coaching. While Brunson more or less watched from the bench as his team got eliminated in seven games, his ascension would continue into the next season. He had a stark improvement from year two to three, but in year four is where Brunson's name would truly emerge in the NBA. We see a regression to the mean efficiency-wise, but while Brunson has defied logic before, that pesky thing will get you at some point. This year is also where Brunson was made more or less a full-time starter and was unleashed as a ball handler. In about 32 minutes a night, Brunson went from 12.6 points per game to 16.3, 3.4 rebounds per game to 3.9, and 3.5 and assists a game to 4.8. While his true shooting and overall efficiency dipped, as I said, he went from 61.8% true shooting to 58.3, which still had him 1.7% above league average. His regular season improvement was once again great, but the 2022 playoffs is where the casual NBA fan truly became aware of Jalen Brunson. This time is also what makes the Luka can't play with other stars or Luka made Brunson worse narrative very stupid. And the funniest part is this discourse came long after these playoffs. People love to look at statistical improvements and conclude that someone made someone else worse when this is really just simple logic. If you have an MVP level player, MVP level guard in Luka, he's gonna handle the ball a lot. Wow, who could have thought? I discussed this much more in my Luka video and don't want to get too off track here, but this playoff run basically proves that Brunson could be doing what Kyrie is right now alongside Luka, if not more, and his stark improvement season to season, while again, playing with Luka, proves this. Going to get off this now because I again basically made an entire video about it already, but yes, someone's numbers are going to improve when they leave a walking 30 and 8. Shocker. Someone's numbers will also improve when they get the minutes and shots they should, and in 2022, we finally got to see this in the playoffs. While he was fine in the Phoenix and Golden State series, I want to hone in on the Utah series. If you told someone at this time that Luka would miss the first three games of this series, any and everyone would automatically assume it's over and the Mavs are very likely in an 0-3 hole. What we didn't know was that first option Brunson was about to be on full display at the NBA level for the first time. In these three games, Brunson averaged 32-5-5 on 51-41-85. This was Jalen Brunson's true coming out party, and I think this stretch, along with the rest of the playoff run, but mainly these three games, are the reason Brunson got his deal with the Knicks. The funniest part is what was deemed an overpay by so many is now arguably the best contract in basketball outside of Wemby, but that's a rookie deal, so it doesn't really count. Oh, and I forgot a huge part of this. Not only did Brunson absolutely ball out, but he also had the Mavs up 2-1 in all reality saving their playoff run. Even if the Mavs went 1-2 here, there is a very good chance that their Western Conference final run never happens. While this three game stretch allowed us to see Brunson lead a team for the first time in the NBA, his playoff run as a whole was still great. Jalen would average 22-5-4 on 47-35-80 for the whole run, and again, without him, who knows what the Mavs are looking like going into Game 4 of the Utah series. Brunson had been quietly ascending to a quality starter in the NBA, but this playoff run showed us that he could be much more than that, and Leon Rose saw this. 
On June 30th, 2022, Jalen Brunson signed a four-year, $104 million deal with the New York Knicks. This was generally perceived as an overpay, but today in 2024, it is one of the best contracts in the NBA. While I am going to discuss just how valuable this contract is now, let's first talk about what made it so valuable. While we are witnessing yet another jump currently, the most important and what will have to end up being the largest jump of Brunson's career was his improvement from his last year in Dallas to his first in New York. This is obviously largely due to a stark increase in opportunity, but was not just that. Brunson evidently took big steps in his game in preparation for becoming at worst a 1B. In his first year in New York, Jalen Brunson increased his scoring by 50% while increasing his efficiency. Everyone figured Brunson could shoot enough to average in and around 20 a night, but near 25 a night with an increase in efficiency is unreal. Brunson's assist numbers also jumped by nearly one and a half, but I feel this is basically solely due to the ball being in his hands more. Brunson's playmaking has inevitably improved since seeing defenses focus on him, but in terms of raw assist numbers, I think that he could have averaged in and around a six with more opportunity in Dallas. While in hindsight, it seems like Brunson instantly became an all-star, this wasn't necessarily the case. We saw Brunson excel as a first option in the playoffs, but that didn't mean there wouldn't be an adjustment period when he got more or less his own team. Through 34 games last year, Brunson was fine and more or less living up to the value of his contract, averaging 23-7 and on 46-37-87. Is this bad per se? No, but is a far cry from even what we saw in the second half of last season. Funnily enough, I was originally splitting this up based on Brunson before and after New Year's 2023, but it worked out to be right in the middle of Brunson's 68 games played. After Christmas Day against the Sixers, Brunson would miss a few games, including his return to Dallas, but after this, he would come back with a vengeance. In his first six games of the year 2023, Brunson averaged 33-6-6 and on 52-50-81, and he would proceed to look like a true star for the rest of the year. While 33-6-6 on that efficiency wasn't sustainable, Brunson still managed to average 28-4-6 for the remainder of the year on better efficiency than his 23-7 first half. To start 2022-23, we saw Jalen Brunson become a 20-a-night guy who was probably worth his contract, and to end that season, we saw Jalen Brunson begin to show legitimate superstar tendencies. Jalen Brunson scored 34-plus 11 times in the 2022-23 season, and all but one of those games occurred in his last 34. Brunson had to adjust to not playing alongside a superstar, and he more than did so. This brings us back to what got Jalen here, the playoffs. This Knicks team met expectations, falling to the eventual Eastern Conference champion Miami Heat in six games in the second round. The Knicks would face off against two elite playoff defenses in the Cavs and Heat, and while I'd be lying if I said Jalen was great in the Cleveland series, he really put the team on his back against Miami. Against the Cleveland Cavaliers, Jalen Brunson more or less met his regular box score production of 24, 4, and 6, but his efficiency was definitely an issue. It's funny, because you look at this efficiency drop from Brunson and Julius Randle's whopping 14, 6, and 3 on 34, 24, 70, and you'd think the Knicks were somped. Instead, they won this series in five games. While Brunson's efficiency drop against an elite defense in the playoffs wasn't very concerning to me, it definitely wasn't helping. Had the Knicks season ended here, my opinion on Brunson likely wouldn't have changed. Efficiency drop off against an elite defense in your first year leading a team, no big deal. But what Brunson did in the following series against the Miami Heat made me believe he could truly jump into superstar territory. In the second round against the Heat, Jalen Brunson would average 31-6-6 on 50-35-89. While Randall wasn't as abysmal as he was in the Cleveland series, he still wasn't good and despite Brunson's gaudy numbers, the Knicks would fall in six games. Brunson's last two games in this series really displayed to me that he has the it factor. I had definitely seen this in him at a college level, but never in a million years that I think Jalen Brunson would be trying to will his team to victory in an NBA playoff series. In games 5 and 6 of the 2023 Eastern Conference Semifinals, in which the Knicks would go 1-1 one and one in a 9-point win and a 4-point loss, Jalen Brunson averaged 39.5 points, 6 rebounds, 6.5 assists, and 2 turnovers on 59-45-86. Doing this in any two games is insane, let alone two playoff games, let alone two playoff games against Eric Spolster and the Miami Heat with your back against the wall. That 45% from three in these two was on 10 attempts a game, by the way, and this is where I began to see even another path for improvement for Jalen. While Brunson has always been nothing short of a phenomenal shooter, his game was predicated, and still is to some extent, on mid-range work and craftiness around the basket. Brunson has always been a good three-point shooter, but never really took them as much as he probably should have. For the playoff run as a whole, this experiment looks bad. 
Brunson increased his 4.73s a night from the regular season to 7.3 in the playoffs and experienced a near 10% drop from 41.6% to 32.5%. But again, this is a very small sample size in a heightened playoff environment. With Brunson's elite shot making ability, I knew he could develop into a higher volume three point shooter and this season he has. This is where we begin to discuss yet another leap from Brunson. While it isn't the eight point per game increase we saw last year, there is still stark improvement, especially in the three point department. I'm going to circle back to the whole three point discussion, but let's just take a look at yet another leap from Brunson as a whole. This year, Jalen Brunson has increased his points, assists, and rebounds per game while maintaining somehow the same exact efficiency. Yes, it was the same exact efficiency. Really, really weird. Never seen this before, but literally identical. Very strange. Anyways, while his increases of 0.3 in rebounds and assists is marginal, going from 24 to near 28 a night while maintaining the same efficiency is not. A large part of the ability to maintain efficiency while increasing scoring is Brunson's increased three-point shooting. Brunson was shooting 41.6% on 4.7 attempts a night last year. Outstanding, right? Well, this year, Brunson is shooting 41.1% on 6.5 attempts a night. Increasing attempts by nearly 40% while only having your percentage drop by 0.5 is stark improvement and should be discussed more. Many were concerned about just how much Brunson could still develop at the age of 26 to 27, and he has found the way. As we know, the three-point shot is at the center of the modern NBA, and Brunson continuing to improve from there is a great sign. I too was wondering just how far a Jalen Brunson-led team could go, and yet another leap at age 27 combined with an elite Knicks roster makes this a more interesting question now. We don't know what the Knicks roster will look like in the future or really even what they will look like even now with Bojan Burks and Randall back, but I think Brunson could become a 39-40% to 40 guy on 8 plus attempts a game in a vacuum given his work ethic holds up, which it will. To wrap this up, seeing Brunson evolve from college great to NBA afterthought to good NBA player to NBA star has been crazy as someone who saw him before the world knew him. I gave some level of number expectations as far as threes, but given Brunson's continued jumps from year to year despite being in his mid to late 20s, I really don't know what the limit is for him. His basketball IQ and work ethic are through the roof and he's also the centerpiece of a great situation now and for the future. The Knicks are in a position to where I might pick them to beat anyone in the East not named Boston right now, and they still have a treasure chest of draft picks to get pretty much anyone who becomes available. The question went from can Jalen Brunson be a good NBA player to can Jalen Brunson be the best player on a championship team, and while I know for Knicks fans this has been a hot topic, let's just appreciate how far he has come. That's going to wrap this one up. If you enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, hit that noti bell, comment down below. What's your thoughts on Brunson right now? You know, what, you know, th this Knicks team again, man, I think they could beat anyone not named Boston. I picked them to beat anyone not named Boston. They, I, they might be able to beat Boston again. I've been saying, you know, the last two years it's been, you know, how is Boston, you know, you know uh, I mean, Boston should win. Boston should win this year. It's like, bro, if Boston doesn't win this year. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> like, <that laughs> look at that team. But man, the Knicks are really in a great spot. They just got Bojan and Burks without giving up a first. They have a treasure chest of draft assets, you know, OG, who is outstanding. They're going to have a, you know, maybe potentially a Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein center rotation for the playoffs, which is just deadly. Again, man, the, the, the future is looking great in New York and the present is looking great in New York. Again, you know, from a vacuum standpoint, you know, I, I again, I, I don't even know why I said vacuum standpoint, but, you know, if Julius Randle underperforms in the playoffs again this year, you, you, you know, I think you start looking into things. That's all I'm saying. Uh, and I think a lot of Knicks fans would agree with me on that. I mean, Knicks fans were, have been ready to ship Randall out for years at this point. So, and, and, I, and I, I know that kind of changed, you know, last year and, you know, yeah, that's kind of changing. I, you know, th they're not as, you know, on that as they were, but. Yeah, man, I'm rambling. I'm just going to wrap this one up. Again, comment your thoughts down below. You know, if you're a Nova fan, comment what this has been like for you. Because it's just, been, I mean, it's been unreal. You know, it, it, I mean, just seeing him, you know, not only become the face of a franchise, become the freight. Wow, I'm down. You know what I'm saying? Become the face of the Knicks, bro. Like the Knicks, like, he, you know, he didn't bring the Knicks back. You know, like, like they, they made the playoffs, whatever, uh, in that little Trey Young year. But, you know, he has brought the Knicks back to real contention. You know, he didn't bring the Knicks back to the playoffs. But he has brought the Knicks back to contention. And that's a... Again, even as a Sixers fan, I, the, the Knicks being good is good for basketball. There's something about the Garden, especially in the playoffs. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, like if you watch, you know. Like, again, like, if you watch, you know, any, like, Knicks primetime game, like, the Garden just has that feel to it. It's, it's, it's just a special thing. And I'm really, really, you know, like, again... You know, I, I'm a Sixers fan. If we were to play y'all, you, you know what side I'm on. But, like, you, you know, I, I think the Knicks, you know, if the Knicks were to go and win one, it would be really cool. I would be rooting for them, you know, definitely over Boston, uh, for sure. But 
that's gonna wrap wrap this one up if you're still watching this comment uh body armor i don't know i'm drinking a body armor right now and comment video ideas down below i think my next video is gonna be a chat video but you know i'm not 100 percent sure you know I, hey man let me know but yeah let's gonna wrap this one up peace